Well, good morning and welcome. It's good to see you here on this Sunday morning. And uh, we look a little different today because uh, we do have uh, a little bit more impact from the coronavirus. But uh, we're glad that you're here. And we just trust that as we gather together this morning, that uh, because you're here, we can uh, bring our voices together and lift a joyful noise unto the Lord. And uh, for those of you who have joined us online, we welcome you as well. And we're grateful that you uh, have chosen to come and be a part of our fellowship today. So uh, as we begin, as we do each week, let me just encourage you that while the prelude is being played, that you would use that time to prepare your hearts for this day of worship and praise to our Savior, Jesus Christ.
Thank you, Kathy. We're going to open with uh, His Name is Wonderful as our opening uh, call to worship. And let me invite each of you to stand. Uh, the words will be behind me on the screen. And if you are at home and you have a hymnal, it's uh, hymn number 101. So please stand as we sing His Name is Wonderful.
Uh, like I said, first one was fine. We don't have any friends, so we didn't have a party. Uh, second one, don't make anything. None of us could cook, so that wasn't a problem. We were dependent on our mom to make us food. Um, if Aaron made anything, it was like uh, scrambled eggs with ketchup. It was some stuff like that. But then you get to the last one, don't play with knives. Now, you would think that this is a very simple task, okay? Uh, just don't touch them. Don't go near them. And to my credit, this instance, I wasn't actually playing with the knife. I was utilizing it in order to open up a candy bar. All right, so all of y'all know what I'm talking about here. Uh, this isn't a sign called reference where you know, a lady's cutting a candy bar with a fork and a knife. Okay? You, open, you get to open something that's in plastic, and you try to, to tear it on perforations, and it won't tear. So then you flip the candy bar the other way, and you try tearing it that way, and it didn't work. I just couldn't get this candy bar to open. I couldn't get it to rip where the little seams came in. So, uh, unlike most normal people, I didn't grab scissors. I grabbed a steak knife, okay? So I grab a steak knife, and I go into our laundry room, because obviously it's safer to be alone and secluded in a laundry room while opening up a candy bar with a knife. So I go into the laundry room with this knife and this Snickers bar, and I'm trying to be super careful, and I'm holding the candy bar here, and I have a knife like this, and it slips, okay? And the blade of the steak knife slices right across my index finger. Uh, if you wanna come up and see the scar later, you can come look at it, it's still there, all right? So here I am, I'm probably eight or nine years old, my finger is just gushing blood, and I'm thinking, this is why you don't play with knives. And I'm looking around like, what am I going to do now? Because there's just blood streaming everywhere. And the only thing that I could figure out to do was to cover it with something. So I'm looking around, I don't see anything, and then I see the dirty clothes camper. So, like a genius, I take it, I stick it in there. And then my mom comes home, why is there blood all over these clothes? So then I got to rehearse for her the entire story of opening up a Snickers bar uh, with a steak knife. So. Those of y'all who are going to be leaving kids at home in the near future, give them that sage wisdom and advice because it's very helpful. Um, and of course, it was all lights that I stuck my hand in anyway. But that was that was advice and counsel for my parents for us to live by, to survive by, uh, to behave by, and live by while they were gone. Okay, that that was the expectation for us as Nathaniel, Aaron, Joel Black. Okay, do these three things, right? This morning in our text, we are going to see uh, more counsel um, that's much more important than not playing with knives. It is counsel for how the church is to conduct herself until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And so this morning, we're going to be working through uh, verses 8 through 16, so we're going to finish up 1 Timothy 3. And uh, there's really two parts to this message. Uh, first, we're going to look at the qualifications for deacons. So those of y'all who are deacons here, your time has come. Okay? So we're looking at the deacons, and then we're going to look into why any of the stuff that we've talked about in 1 Timothy 2 through 3 matters. Because Paul's going to tie it all up near the end. Right? And so we're going to see why he's dragged us through uh, all of these uh, commands, these initiatives, and then how that impacts us today. And so, first we're going to look at the qualifications for deacons in verses 8 through 13, so follow along with me. Uh, I would also pull, you know, I encourage you to pull out the bulletin that has the outline. Uh, but verses 8 through 13, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives also must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons, gain their children, gain a good standing for themselves, and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And so, uh, first thing I want you to look at this morning is just the term deacon, right? Uh, the term deacon can mean a lot of things depending on what sort of church denomination you're in. What I wanted you to see this morning is the Greek word for deacon is diakonos, a diakonos. 
It's used 31 times in the New Testament. Only three times actually refer to the office of deacon. Other times it's translated minister. Paul is referred to as a minister. Uh, Phoebe is referred to as a diakonos in Romans chapter 16. Um, and other, other folks mentioned in the New Testament are referred to in this way. But there's three usages that refer to the office of deacon. All right? And a deacon is literally one who executes the commands of another, um, especially of a master, a servant, an attendant. He's the servant of a king. One who, by virtue of the office assigned to him by the church, cares for the poor and has charge of and distributes the money collected for their use. So uh, that definition from Strong's is talking about how the term deacon is used in the New Testament. Um, another way to look at it is a waiter, one who serves food and drink. All right, so if you're looking for a, a bare bones definition in any sort of concordance you look up, that's what you're going to see for deacon. Uh, but in verses 8 through 13, Paul lists out qualifications for the office of deacon. Right? And he's giving us an idea of what exactly deacons do and, and what exactly deacons are supposed to be like. And right off the bat, one of the first things that we're going to notice is that deacons have similar qualifications to that of elders. So, for example, in verse number 8, they're said to, that they need to be dignified. All right? Same Greek word as respectable for elders in verse number 2. Uh, second, they're not addicted to much wine in verse 8. It's also similar to not being a drunkard as a pastor in verse number 3. Uh, not greedy for dishonest gain, uh, meaning not a lover of money just like an elder. Blameless, okay? same word as being above reproach. So deacons are supposed to be above reproach as well. Also, they're to be faithful church members, okay? husband of one wife, literally a one-woman man, and, and this is really referring to the, the, the faithfulness, the faithful character of a husband with his wife. Okay, So he has eyes only for her. You have eyes only for your spouse. And then finally, we look at they are to be above reproach in their personal home life. So uh, Paul writes that they are to manage their children and their own households well in verse number 12. Same language that we saw for a pastor in verse number four, keeping your children submissive, uh, managing them well. And so, whenever it comes to these qualifications, there's actually a little bit of overlap, okay? A lot of uh, the, the personal and the home life qualifications are very similar. Yet, whenever we look at this, we have to be aware that there are some specific distinctions, okay, between an elder and a deacon. And we're going to look at those. I'm going to give you three, okay, just for the sake of time. Uh, this could go much longer, but I'm not going to do that to you all this morning. Uh, but I'm going to look at, we're going to look at three distinctions between elders and deacons in verses 1 through 13. And then we're going to look at an application or an illustration of what deacons should look like. That's in Acts chapter 6. So if you want to flip ahead and, and hold your place with your finger or something for outline. So first distinction very simple one. Paul writes an entirely different section which sets up this distinction. Okay, think about it. If elders and deacons were essentially the same thing, why have two specific paragraphs addressing each office? Okay, uh, they would basically be synonymous at that point, but that's not what Paul does. He makes a distinction between the two. And we see this actually in Philippians 1 verse 1. So, like one of the very first sermons that I preached while I was here was through Philippians. And so, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul writes, To all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops, pastors, and deacons. So, he sets up that biblical distinction. So, that's one. First easy one. Everywhere in the New Testament, you see the distinction between the two. Second, Paul points out in verse 11 that there is a category for women to serve as deacons, or you could also call them deaconesses. All right, so ladies, if you're a deaconess here this morning, this is your biblical foundation, okay? This is where you come from if, if you are a deaconess here at the church. And so, verse number 11, uh, Paul writes, and this is gonna be a little confusing, so we're gonna need class participation this morning. He writes, their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. All right, so class participation. 
Who here this morning is using the King James Version, English Standard Version, or the NKJV this morning? Any hands? Oh, good. All right. I don't have to make my Bill Belichick joke then. Yes. All right. I'll raise your hands. All right. Most translations, especially the older ones, uh, have the terms their wives okay, in the translation. So if you raise your hand, that's what you see in your Bible. However, the Greek literally says women, okay? Gunet. Is the term that we get gynecology from. All right, that's an impressive tidbit for y'all to chew on this morning. Okay, so uh, that's what the term literally reads. And you might also notice that in your Bible, the term there is in italics, okay, which indicates that in the original language, it's not in the text. It's actually put there in order to smoothen out the translation. All right, because literally it would say, women must likewise be dignified. All right, and that's actually the, the translation reflected in the NASB and the NIV. All right, so if you have those translations, that's what you're going to see there. Now, from a translational standpoint, and I know that this is kind of egg-headed and so we all don't care, but from a translational standpoint, it could go either way. It could be wives or it could be women. And this leads us to three different understandings for what verse 11 is talking about. First, the wives of deacons traditional way of approaching the, the verse. Second, it could refer to married women who serve in the same capacity of ministry-wise as male deacons. That's why it's put in the same paragraph. Or it could be unmarried women who serve in the same capacity as male deacons. And no matter which understanding you embrace this morning, okay, you're free to debate those things, right? Whichever one you take, what we can nail down with the certainty is that we don't see similar qualifications for women in verses 1 through 7. And so what Paul is pointing out here is that there is a biblical category for women serving in a ministry capacity as deacons, but not as elders. Which is exactly what Paul talked about in 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 14. And it's probably because of the issues in Ephesus. Okay, you remember at the very beginning of, of Paul's epistle to Timothy here, there were agitators in Ephesus. And they were stirring up the church. They were trying to teach false doctrine, a false view of the gospel. They were encouraging women to leave the creative purposes of God and embrace a role in the church that they weren't allowed to take by virtue of what God has given us. And so, they're trying to encourage them to misuse the office of deaconess or assert themselves in a shepherding role, all right? And so, that's the second distinction here, is that for deacons, there is a female category, whereas with elders, you don't see that in Scripture. It's not there. Third distinction, while deacons and deaconesses are to be spiritual believers, they are not called to be the spiritual shepherds over the flock. When we consider the qualifications of elders and deacons, one of the chief distinctions that we see in 1 Timothy 3 is that elders are to be able to teach. They are to instruct. They are to feed the flock of God with the word of God. That's what we see in verse number 2. But you don't see that same qualification repeated for deacons. In other words, the calling to shepherd the flock, feed his people through the word, and apply the word in the various ministries of the church falls upon the elders or the pastors of the congregation, not deacons. And this is what we see everywhere else in Scripture. Acts 20, verse 28, Paul is talking to the elders, and he says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 3, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ to shepherd the flock that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples. So the examples to the flock, those who feed the flock and shepherd the flock, are the elders. Hebrews 13, verse number 7, the writer is writing to uh, Jewish Christian believers, and he's telling them, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. 
Okay, this is the responsibility and the role that is laid at the feet of those who have been called and equipped to pastor the church. With, uh, with deacons, those expectations aren't there. You don't see that in 1 Timothy 3. You don't see it in Titus. And you don't see it in any other epistle in the New Testament. And so, while deacons and deaconesses are to hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience in verse 9, that's what Paul writes, there's no biblical category for deacons to have an official teaching or preaching role in the church. Nor should we as a church require or expect them to, especially if you're not gifted or called to do such a thing. Okay? No one should ever be thrust into the pulpit if they aren't called to preach and don't have a desire to do so. All right? And I mean, shoot, if we have deacons that can teach and preach and they enjoy that kind of thing, if we have an opening, sure. But it's not an expectation. It's not a demand. We saw earlier that, like elders, deacons must manage their own house and children well. But when Paul describes the qualifications of deacons, he omits the part about them caring for God's church. You notice that he writes about that in 1 Timothy 3, verse 5, with elders. Okay? You're to manage your own household well, because if you can't manage your own household, how do you expect to manage a group of a whole castle of people? All right? Now, he says the same thing about deacons, but there's nothing there about them caring about the church and feeding the flock with the word of God, because that's a function that belongs to pastors. And then, Paul points out that a person must be tested before becoming a deacon. That's in verse number 10. And he doesn't say that a person can't be a new convert. Now, you remember, he points out earlier in 1 Timothy 3, Three, that a pastor shouldn't be a new convert because he might become puffed up and fall to the snare of the devil. Okay, so pride in, in a ministry position like a pastor or an elder is a very real threat. But if you're a deacon or a deaconess, okay, you're not in that lofty leadership position where you're leading the flock and feeding the flock. Okay, the temptation to be torn away with pride and to fall to the sin of pride isn't quite as much there for servants as it is for shepherds. All right, so that's why Paul uh, doesn't put that part in 1 Timothy 3, verse 10. Now, all of this is fine and good, but what does it actually look like? Okay, we see the qualifications, we see how that could be helpful, but what does it look like to be elder versus deacon? For that distinction, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter number 6. So in Acts 6, verses 1 through 7, we had an illustration of what this looked like in the early church. And what we're going to see is kind of the prototype for church uh, leadership in this passage. So I'll start in Acts 6, verse number 1, and we're going to read through to verse 7. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, okay, Greeks, that were, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we, okay, the twelve, the apostles, should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Tim I was going to say Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient in the faith. And so what observations can we glean from those seven verses? First, like future elders and pastors, the apostles were devoted to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So preaching and teaching the Bible and applying it to the lives of those who were in Jerusalem, into the local church, that was the calling of the apostles, similar to the calling of pastors and elders. Okay, this was their primary calling, and since that is their primary calling, they chose seven to take up these uh, physical, logistical needs. This division of labor is similar to what we see to elder and deacon. 
Okay, so rather than the apostles going, leaving the word of God and serving tables and making sure everything's fair and working out well, you pick other people to do that. Okay, uh, you delegate. It's literally what they're doing here. Verse three lists three things. Right? No, notice what Luke writes here. These deacons, these these men, were to be men of good repute. Okay, in other words, they're to be dignified and respectable, just like in First Timothy three. They're full of the spirit. They're full of wisdom. Very similar to holding the mystery of the faith with a good, clear conscience. Okay? What they claim to believe is lived out in their lives. Okay? They are men of repute. They are full of wisdom. They have a good standing before the congregation. Very similar to what you see in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. And therefore, what we can glean from this is that the biblical role of deacons is to take care of the physical and logistical needs. Okay? Widows are being neglected. Okay, let's organize and set things up so that they're not being neglected anymore. Right? You don't need to be an ordained minister of the gospel to do that. Okay? You just have to be a willing servant who wants to care and help these people. All right? From a practical standpoint, this is why our church has deacons who have deacons lists. We call them shepherds lists. Okay. Everyone in the church is distributed among the deacons that we have, right? And those lists are there for you to actually interact with your deacon. And if you have a physical need, okay, if you have something that needs to get done and you need help with it, you reach out to your deacon, all right? That way, that way Dave and I aren't, you know, leaving our offices in the middle of the day or doing something. Not that it's a burden, okay, but they, there's a whole bunch of people. Right? And if it's not a spiritual problem, if it's not something that is a, a spiritual in nature, but it's a physical one, okay, you have a deacon that's over you that can be helpful in that area. If you're a woman, we have deaconesses that you can reach out to. Because I get it. Sometimes you don't want to ask a man to interact with you on something. Maybe it's a doctor's visit. Maybe you're needing to go to the doctor. You need help with that. A moving. Okay? Whenever Megan and I moved here, uh, Bill, <laughs> he helped me move from Bloomfield and back uh, two trips, you know, there and back that day, all right? Uh, delivering food, other items for homebound members, helping up set up services, other church activities. These are all good things that deacons can be helpful with. Even building maintenance, men's work days, okay? It's a good opportunity for deacons to be invested. The benevolent fund, all right? The benevolent fund is there. We give to the benevolent fund so that we can help one another within the congregation. Okay? And it's so that uh, we can be helpful and loving to others within our house as they have need. And so, if you're ever finding yourself in need of help, if you're struggling with something, whether it's financially, physically, maybe you can't just you, you can't move a piece of furniture from one place to another, contact your deacon. Now, you might want to get some of the younger ones because some of y'all's furniture is heavy. So, you know, you want to, be, you want to be mindful about that sort of thing. But the deacons are there to be helpful. Okay, don't shy away from reaching out to them. Right? These are physical, logistical needs that need to be met. And whenever you reach out for deacons, you're not only helping yourself get stuff done, meeting a need, but you're also helping the deacons fulfill their role of being deacons. Right? You're actually helping them to embrace that role and live it out day in and day out. So that's kind of my you know, promotion for <laughs> utilizing the deacons. Okay, that's what they're there for, all right? But they're not pastors. They're not elders. And so we don't think about them that way. That's not what we see in the Word of God. Now, cool story. Glad we know a little bit more about deacons. But why does that matter at all? <laughs> We're living in the year 2021, all right? A lot of stuff going on. How is that helpful to me today? How is this whole discussion about deacons? Uh, how is that whole discussion about elders? And then about gender roles, about praying, having a gospel emphasis. How is that helpful? In the next three verses, Paul is going to give us two things to hang our hats on as we leave this morning. All right? He's going to tell us and explain for us why everything he's talked about actually matters. All right? And he's going to do it in verses 14 through 16, so follow along with me. I hope to come to you soon. So I'm hoping to come to you, Timothy. Hoping to come back to Ephesus soon. But I am writing these things so that you, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, 
a pillar and a buttress of the truth. So Paul is hoping to return to Ephesus at some point. He doesn't know when that's going to be. He might be delayed. He was often delayed. But he's writing so that if that delay does occur, Timothy, who's a younger guy serving this pastoral role, knows how to conduct the church, knows how to minister effectively, knows how to deal with people like Hymenaeus and Alexander and help the church move forward. All right? And so he gives us two things. He, call, he talks about who and what the church is, and the next one, who and what the church believes. So first, who and what the church is. These are things to help Timothy, help us even, as we move forward. Now, you'll notice in verse number 14 and 15, he writes about these things, all right? I'm trying to come to you soon, but if it doesn't happen, I'm writing these things. What is the these things referring to? Okay, the antecedent to that is everything he's written about in chapters 2 through 3, all right? You'll recall at the beginning of chapter 2, verse number 1, he says, I urge you first, Okay, so first thing in this list of stuff that I'm calling on you to do and to live by, okay, I urge you to have prayer for all kinds of people, okay, governors, rulers, all kinds of people in all kinds of places. And so he points that out in chapter 2, verse number 1, and everything that he's written is describing how the church is to behave, how the church is to live. Now, Paul has a couple of descriptor, descriptors here about what the church is. Right? He says first that the church is the household of God. Do you not like how clear Paul is here? Okay? Whenever he says household of God, another way of putting that is the family of God. Okay? Those who live in my household are in my family. Maybe Beta, Pippa, and Lem. Okay? Uh, even Max the cat, Muskrat, he belongs outside, but we can't because of Bobcats. So yeah, he's a part of our family too. Okay, but whenever Paul is describing the church, he describes it as the household, the family of God. Oh, how we need to have clarity like this today. In a day where terminology is either being canceled or changed in order to not offend people, it is refreshing to see how clear Paul is. Okay? The whole human race is not the family of God. The church is. The church is the household, not everyone, okay? God is the Father in the sense of being creator of all things and all people. Absolutely, you can go there with it. But only the church has been purchased by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church and the church alone. Think about all the songs that were sung this morning. That vein is running throughout all of those hymns, even the closing one, all right? So the church has been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is God's treasured possession. We were once of the world, okay? We were sons of disobedience, children of the wicked one. But God, by his grace, chose us, adopted us, called us, and we have been made a part of God's family, okay? The church is God's family, not everywhere, not everyone else. But... There's another way to approach this verse, and it's to understand that we are God's house. We are God's temple. The church, the called out assembly of believers. When we come here on Sunday mornings, we are not coming to a church, not to a building, okay? This building is not the church you and I are, okay? The people are the church. The called out assembly of believers is the church. This is just a building. It's a building that the church pays for. All right, the building of the church meets in. Now, even though God loves his church, he gave his son for the church and has redeemed the church, the church is not free to operate and do whatever it wants. Okay, just like my family. Okay, Vader, Pip, and Lum, I love them. Okay, but that doesn't mean that they have license to do whatever they want and to conduct themselves however they want. Okay, our society thinks that that's the case. To love is to give license today. But that's not the case with the church. Okay? Paul has written everything from chapter 2 to chapter 3 so that we as the church know how to conduct ourselves well as the church of the living God. Okay? Not doing our own thing. If we're going to be the church, we have to behave according to God's guidelines. And there's a certain conduct that we are to embrace and to display. And this means that no one outside of the church gets to tell us how to be the church. You see a lot of that today. Okay? 
Okay, and I'm not talking about the COVID guidelines, okay? I understand that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the world coming in and saying, you should teach this. You shall not teach this. You should hold this view of human sexuality. This view of marriage. No, we are God's church. He is the possessor, okay? Not the world. They're outside. Okay? They're still in the realm of the prince of the power of the air. Okay? They're children of disobedience. Okay? We're hoping that through the church's witness they come to Christ, but we don't know that yet. All right? But we are to live as the church of God, his treasured possession. But Paul doesn't simply tell us who the church is. He also tells us that these things are written because of what the church does. And he describes the church as a pillar and a buttress of the truth. Now, just to explain that terminology really quick, okay, we are not the pillar of the truth in the sense that we are foundational or the grounds for the truth. It's actually the other way around. Okay? The church exists because of the truth of the gospel, not the other way around. The church doesn't create what the truth is. Right? That's why we had a Protestant Reformation right, back in the 1500s, right? because someone like Martin Luther dawned upon him that things are all backwards. All right, so uh, the truth is foundational to the church. And so what Paul is saying here in referring to the church as a pillar and a buttress of the truth is that the church, whether it is the universal church, the church, everyone who's redeemed, okay, or local church, us here, North Stonington, the church is essential. I use that terminology purposely. The church is essential to the proclamation and protection of the truth of the gospel. And that's why this text is so especially helpful. Because whenever Timothy's reading this for the first time, he's waiting for Paul to show up in Ephesus. But you and I ain't waiting for Paul. Okay? He's been gone in glory for a very, very long time. But we are waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so everything that Paul has written is so helpful and encouraging and instructive to us as we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing, folks. We do not know when that is going to happen. Okay. We can have newspaper clippings and they go down to our basement and have everything diagram. Okay, You can do that. We've been doing that for you know, decades. But we don't know when he's returning. We hope it's soon, but we don't know. Paul is pointing out that these things in chapters 2 and 3 matter because when the church neglects them, ignores them, or becomes lazy in any of these areas, whenever the church becomes lazy in its gospel emphasis, what does the church become? It's not a place where people are coming to meet Christ, to know Christ. It's a country club, right? Whenever the church neglects or refuses to accept the biblical teaching, God's creative design between men and women, and boldly embrace that, you get the world that we have today, where you can pick whatever gender you want to be, or anything in between. Okay? A lot of that has to do with us as the church not living as we should. Right? We can lay it at our feet. Yeah, governments are corrupt. Okay? Universities are corrupt. But how do most universities, things like that, start? Christian churches. Okay? They were church movements, colleges founded by ministers of the gospel. And so we as a church need to embrace what Paul has written because whenever we don't, we open the door for false doctrine, sin, spiritual decay, spiritual apathy, to inundate and overflow the church. And it's not just a worldwide, I'm talking about locally it happens. All of us in here even know examples of it. Okay? Most of you all have lived long enough, you've seen that happen in local churches. And here's the thing, it is going to become more and more vital for us as the church to get this right in the coming years. We are to proclaim the truth and to protect it. In Ephesus, they had to proclaim and protect it from men like Hymenaeus and Alexander. We have the same problem. Okay? Not a whole lot of people named you know, Hymenaeus walking around, but we have false teachers all over the place. We have a society that's telling us what to believe and how to believe it. This has been happening for quite a while, and you and I know it. And it's only being accentuated by the election. Okay? Right? I've gotten to talk with a lot of folks, and a lot of us are worried, apprehensive about what the future holds. 2020 was a horrendous year. 2021 isn't looking much better so far. And so there's a lot of doom and gloom that's hanging over the church right now. A lot of doom and gloom hanging over our, our heads. Okay? Many of us as Christians are upset, worried, and discouraged. 
We speak about the way that things used to be. We speak about the America that I knew, wanting to get our country back, uh, the onslaught of political philosophies that are being uh, laid before us like a smorgasbord. Okay? We look at these things as threats to our way of life, and we ask, how are we supposed to live as godly, faithful believers? How are we supposed to live as a church in the midst of a, of a world like that? First, understand that this isn't the first time in history that things have looked kind of tough for the church. First century Roman Empire, an absolutely horrendous time frame. Christians being used as candlesticks, being fed to lions, tigers, and bears in a Colosseum. Think about the founding of the United States of America. Where did it start from? Religious persecution across the pond, and they came over here. And what did they do whenever they came over here? Did they speak about the glories of Mother England and living and hoping for England to turn back to Christ? No. They started a civil body politic here, okay, and they began to get serious about what God was commanding the church to live like. You and I today need to do the same thing. We as a church need to be serious and embrace the things that Paul has given us, that God has given us in his word. They pro the people who came here to America originally prioritized what they saw in Scripture. You and I need to prioritize what we see in Scripture, living according to the Word. But that's not all. Okay? It's not simply about what the church is and who the church is and that mattering to what Paul has written. What Paul has written up to this point is also important. It also matters because of who and what the church believes. The separatists and the Puritans who came here in the 1600s, they, they didn't simply have this glorious vision of who the church was, they also had an even greater and a more glorious vision of who Christ is. And so this morning, in the remaining part of the passage, verse number 16, it's almost like Paul is laying out before Timothy in the church at Ephesus. Okay, yeah, you've got problems. Things are turbulent. But keep in mind who you serve, who has purchased you through his blood. Who is it that is the head of the church? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he lays it out for us in verse number 16. Follow along as I read this. It's actually a really Christian hymn. Paul writes, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. The mystery. Okay? You want to know the secret to living godly in this present age? to living as God wants us to in this present age, with all the evil, with, with all of the dangers and the turbulence approaching us, how we live, what is the secret? The mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, indicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Amen. The reason why we can be godly and live as godly people, be a godly church, a true lighthouse on a hill in the midst of a dark world in dark times. It's because of who Christ is. Okay. And look at how he describes him. He points out, and as we read through this, okay, I'm going to look for a word at the end, and I want you to see, I want to see how many of y'all get this. So it's another game, all right? He was revealed in the flesh. Though Jesus Christ pre existed with the Father, he is God. He did come into this world. We just celebrated that at Christmas. This is the incarnation. And though his deity was veiled, he was revealed to be God in his humiliation and in his humility to be the Son of God, God himself, the second person. So he was revealed in the flesh, God becoming man. He was vindicated in the spirit, right? And there's a couple different ways that people look at this, but the way that I tend to look at it is that he is vindicated in that Yes, he died, but he isn't a dead sinner. He died in the place of sinners. And he was vindicated being raised from the dead. The Spirit rose him from the dead. He is not guilty. He is not a sinner. He didn't deserve to die. He died the death that you and I deserve. And so the Spirit vindicates the Lord Jesus Christ. He vindicates Jesus' deity, his divinity. Okay? Jesus Christ is God who has died in the place of others. That's the Jesus whom you and I love and serve, the one who is revealed through the incarnation and the one who is vindicated by the Spirit of God. Quick cross references, Romans 1, verses 1 through 4, you can look at that later. 
He was seen by angels. Okay? And this might refer to the angels at his tomb on the day that he was resurrected, or the angels that witnessed his ascension. Okay? One way or the other, the Lord Jesus Christ died, was buried, and has risen again. He is vindicated by the Spirit, and the, and the angels have seen him. But, Scripture also tells us that he's coming back again. And that is one of the things that we proclaim as the church. He is proclaimed among the nations, Paul's right. Paul writes, the news of his word has gone throughout all the world. The news of the Lord Jesus Christ, him coming, him living a perfect, sinless life, and dying on the cross, being buried, and rising from the dead, is being proclaimed. Even now, that is what the mission of the church is, to proclaim the gospel and make disciples for his name. Not only is he preached throughout all the nations, but he is believed on. Every tribe, tongue, nation, and kindred. That's what the church is made up of. Okay? All kinds of people. So we should have a gospel influence and emphasis that includes all kinds of people. It is a universal proclamation from pe of people resting and trusting in him. Finally, Jesus is glorious. Everything going on around us today, very dark, sinful, no glory whatsoever, but we serve an even more glorious Christ who will come again, who will redeem us, who will vindicate us. And because of that, because of that hope, we know that we will one day be glorified with him. That's why Paul writes, writes about that in past tense. He, in Romans chapter number 8, he said we will be glorified with him, that we have that hope and we know that that hope is sure. And so we as a church can live as the church in light of who we are, yes, but more importantly, who Christ is. And so we, may we today, as Second Baptist Church, as believers, the called out assembly of the Lord Jesus Christ, understand why Paul wrote what he wrote in chapters 2 and 3, but may we, even more, more importantly, live as the church that God has redeemed. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again for this morning. We thank you for just having the opportunity to come here and to worship you. Lord, we, we've been told that the darkest days are yet ahead of us, and we, we, we have that promise laid at our feet, but Lord, we know that the glor most glorious days are yet ahead of us. We know that you are coming again. We don't know when that will be, but we know that it will be soon. And Lord, until then, you have given us everything that we need in order to be godly in this world and live as the church that you redeemed in this world. And so, Lord, I pray that as we live out the rest of this day and throughout the rest of this week, that we will consider how we measure up and how we are living in light of what we've read and what we've learned about so far. And, Lord, may our hearts and our eyes be continually turned up to you, that we will set our eyes upon you, the most glorious and magnificent person of all. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Joel. Our closing hymn is Rise Up, O Church of God, hymn number 293. Shall we stand as we close with this hymn?
now closes this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You were dismissed. I hope you see you all here tonight. Thank you.